you know, when it comes to gigs and monetizing your art, is that can be a problem. But yeah. it's kind of like it's how yeah, it's what I love. That's what I love. Somehow we just make it happen. Exactly. Yeah. How? Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official Com. THTC, the UK's leading ethical streetwear label. Organically grown and ethically built garments from hemp, organic cotton, and other sustainable materials. 2019 is their 20th anniversary year. Join me with THTC as a Killer Killer podcast sponsor celebrating music, social activism, hemp, and street culture. THTC, eco fashion redefined since 1999 101.4 FM 24 hours a day all genres next FM.co.uk Beatbox created Killer Cow and we're here to talk about world music and street culture Killer Cow podcast Ladies and gentlemen this is the Killer Keller podcast Switching on now. Big shout out to Graffiti Kings inside the place. And what a glorious yet sweaty, sticky summer we are in the midst of right now. But this is Evergreen, so you'll never know the difference because you could be anywhere, any place right now. We're tapped in international and this is all about street culture, artist to artist talk. And uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you. Man, who I've actually only just met, which I'm really pleased I have. Uh, he goes by the name of Sam, Sam Interface, um, aka Snow, producer, engineer, extraordinary, Rinse FM, like just a general good egg and collaborator with so many people. And uh, yeah, I love it when a producer comes in. Hold tight, Sam. <laughs> hey Thanks for having me, mate. <laughs> How are you? I'm okay, a little bit clammy, but um, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. life is good. I can't complain. Look, you know, we're yeah. in a crazy time right now, and I think. Definitely lucky compared to a lot of people who can still do what I do. And Yeah, that's true. There's a lot to be said about the lifestyle that artists have. And actually, it's just like the minor transitions. It actually makes life a little bit easier when those other burdens aren't there. Yeah, like It's true, yeah. I mean, yeah, especially the whole lockdown thing as well. With, you know, as, as a, someone who spends most of his time in a dark room <laughs> on his own, it did it, it, it was quite normal for me. It was actually more social for me than life <laughs> normally is. Yeah. All this Zoom shit. Yeah. Like, oh. Yeah, and I, actually, I, I took my studio home for three weeks and spent a lot more time with my girlfriend and we started gardening and, and mm. we got a dog and who's here today. Yes, hold tight, Chi. Yeah. There is, there's a third party in here, yes. Um, who are keeping entertained with a mixture of uh, cuddly toys uh, and dog treats. Yeah, that was a that was that that planned then during the lockdown. All these extracurricular things. Did it, no, know? we got him in January, mm. so or oh, okay. beginning of Feb, and we'd been planning it for a while. That's timing, and, but it was perfect timing. Yeah, super timing. So it meant we had a good excuse to get out of the house yeah. once a day, which is something as as a producer. This is how I've come to understand producers in my time of collaborating doing records and podcasts especially it's just a, it can be a hermit's life can't it it can be yeah i'm definitely guilty of that <laughs> really for sure, yeah although i'm a hermit but then a lot of my work has been especially in the last i don't know decade i suppose almost now like has been travel based like um i've spent a lot of time in the caribbean trinidad most most specifically nice. um working out there I kind of, uh, yeah, just found myself there. I mean, it's, uh, I guess before that, I started out as Interface. I was in, grew up in Glastonbury and moved to Bristol as a, uh, yeah, as a teenager or late teenager. To obviously, I was in love with drum and bass music, and obviously that was the mecca for mm. drum and bass music. It was just up the road. Standard. Um, linked up with the, you know, I kind of got a job in a bar and met everyone because it's such a small place, and uh, linked up with people like Clips and DJ Die and Ronnie mm. Size and uh, Skate or Die Man, um, the original Dons. Yeah, um, D Mines. They, they at the time were running a night called run in this yeah. club called native which That's was where no, i, was I, play, I the played bar. there yeah, i'm I sure i saw you down right, there yeah. yeah so i was working the bar there every tuesday that was a really cool club as well i feel like that was like my musical education like 
working, you'd have the run there on the Tuesday, which was kind of like the premier yeah, German yeah. bass night in the country. You'd have by Andy C playing there on a Tuesday night with 200 capacity and you have mm. 800 people waiting outside. Big shout out to Jake's as well. That's my yes. dog. Eh? Yeah, big up Jake's. He was a yeah. uh, state every time I go. He was there. He like, was there. there every week. Yeah. yeah. He was he was the mic man. Yeah. If anyone if anyone else wanted to touch the mic at run, you had to ask Jake's. It was his mic. <laughs> It always felt like it was like a, it, it was an event. Every time I would go to anyway, cameras were there, things were there. It was all popping. And, I mean, yeah, and yeah. you had the dirt sound. It was literally two hundred capacity, small so club, cute. but they bought yeah. in the dirt sound system, which was like massive, yeah. bone shattering rig in this little club, and it's just rammed every week. But then. Also, on a Saturday night, you'd get people like Norman Jay and Giles Peterson and uh. um, Quantic. And and then a Friday, you'd have some of the early dubstep nights going on. So, a, And you'd have UK funky nights. And it was a real, like, musical education for me. So a lot you were of just like there, well. just like, yeah. listening in. Yeah, getting, like, it's quite hazy days as well, because the life of, you know, music-loving DJ, producer, bar person was quite... Messy, you could say. <laughs> there was the, there was a lot of rum and sambuca and all sorts of things Dude. ingested. <laughs> Can you tell me about that? I've had one hell of a weekend of it. So <laughs> I'm with you, brother. I don't think that shit ever leaves you, especially when you're a producer and DJ. Do you know what I mean? You flip, and it's uh, it, that actually the, the 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 light and dark of that. Mm. Yeah, I found that balance harder as I've got older. I think guess I guess as you get older, you're less keen to go out you you know the, a night uh, a weekend in mm. watching netflix with the missus is and just as appealing as a rave sometimes well this and is uh, where is the dog comes in to play because you know resets your mm. it, it anchors you doesn't it Mate, the home's a home but also we mentioned it earlier off camera like i feel like in this modern generation there's so much content to consume and as as a, i feel like i have a guilt as a dj that i need to be you know there's, for one, there's just more music than ever coming out week after week, and it's so hard to keep up with things. And mm. and um, but there's also podcasts, there's amazing TV, and mm. and other kinds of media, and it's just quite mm. overwhelming. Sometimes I open up Spotify and I get anxiety, just like just <laughs> everything's there. What can I listen to? I kind of miss the day where you had to save up for the one CD that you were going to listen to every day for the yeah, next. Yeah. Month. It's interesting you say that because as as podcasting, as artists, as producers, as DJs, it's in our nature to to want to provide. It's the kind of it's almost like a Giles Peterson effect, isn't it? In a way, and we we're talking about Giles then is that he that you just knew he was always there. There was always a presence, whether it was the One World, whether it was like Radio One, whether it was him doing essential mixes on CDs for back to, was it back to minds or something like that? He, he, decades. Still there now, still doing it, probably on six music, well, I don't know. But yeah, Saturday afternoon. I think, right. Yeah. So, so there you go, I, right? I know that because my girlfriend is also a DJ and she filled in for him from the last three weeks. Boom. Right, see? So there, yeah, hold tight, Giles. See, I got you. Yeah. But, and that's the thing, see? You just know he's there. It's an energy that you know that, that, that you can rely on him because of his legacy and because of his branding and you just know it's there and i think it's kind of, it kind of works for us artists as well i mean like you've done a lot of mixes you've done a lot of even behind the scenes stuff do you know what I mean? yeah. and it's just it's it, we all we all fiend for that yeah mist of presence and yeah there's just more yeah more of it than ever and and yeah i just find like life you're constantly juggling like I'm, I always take on too much. I feel like throughout my career, I could have probably been a lot more successful. Maybe I mean, I you know, I f I feel like I'm in my well into my thirties now and still making a living off music. So that's a success in itself. Doesn't matter. Um, but maybe I could have been more successful if I kept to one thing. But I don't know. I've always th thrived off of doing different things and and maybe being. In between genres, yeah, and uh, that's often hard, to, you know, when it comes to gigs and monetizing your art is that can be a problem. But yeah. it's kind of like it's how, yeah, it's what I love. It's what I love. Somehow we just make it happen. Exactly. Yeah. How? <laughs> Close. 
But it does, you right? just make it work, yeah. But it can be, can be stressful at times. Yeah, yeah. Is, that a th- is it blind faith? If, you're, if you were going back to run days, if, well, back to Bristol days, and you were there and seeing these guys do it, you don't really recognise... Because often it isn't as hand, hand-to-mouth as you think, but you get those months where it's like hand-to-mouth and you've got like four different projects on the go and it's almost like, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a Russian roulette. Which one's going to get, mm. get out the door first? And which one's going to be the money one? Which one's going to be the gig? Which one's going to be the... Um, but when you're watching them from back in the day as a fan, you don't really recognise it. No, you see them as superstars, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. And then you, I guess the more you get into the business, you realise, you know, everyone's the same. Mm. We're, we're, all, we're all just people who love music and yeah. you might feel like a superstar for those 40 minutes to an hour you're on stage, but then you come off and yeah. you're just, yeah. yeah. Sam from Glastonbury. Yeah. Or, <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? or Lee from <laughs> Lee from Horsham, yeah. Bill and Crawley, <laughs> Sussex. Um, all right, let's take it back there. So... That, so, because we were talking about Z, we were talking about clips, um, red light. These are all, these are all very prominent people. They actually, they're, they're I didn't meet Z Bias till later, but uh, clips. When I moved to Bristol, he was definitely. I remember before I even moved to Bristol, we were interface to start off with as a crew. We, uh, it was four of us. We we had a studio in this town called Bridgewater, which is just down the road from Glastonbury. That's so sick. I and, love uh, the fact it was a crew. And, uh, did you have, did you have something interface? So it's Sam interface, did, like, um, Ram- like Ramones, you know what I mean? N- no, back then we was a crew, but then one, you know, one of the guys uh, got his girlfriend pregnant, and he kind of moved away from it. Yeah. Uh, another one, my little brother was in the crew for a minute, but he kind of lost interest in in the music yeah. more and just went down a more kind of nine to five route. And then my other mate Billy, me and Billy. Billy was kind of the least technical mm. side of it, but he was like almost like our promoter. Like he, he, he Billy had a big mouth and everyone knew Billy. <laughs> yeah, and is. so when we moved to it's Bristol, be. he'd be like, we'd have a gig somewhere random on a Thursday night and he'd, he'd be like, the, the lights would go that, that or up and Billy'd be like, right, there's the address. Everyone back to our house. And before you know it, within like three months of living in Bristol we knew everyone because Billy was just like that blagging it into like parties yeah. and doing all the thing getting people around to yours and uh yeah. so Billy I think met Clips way back before we even moved to Bristol and kept in contact with him and mm. I remember he, he invited us back when he was deep in the full cycle crew they all had this big studio in Barton Hill and Clips invited us up and showed us showed us a studio, listened to some of our tunes, and I think... And you were slowly melting, like, what the fuck? Yeah, but he was just always really cool, and we've yeah. been friends ever since. And mm-hmm. um, But it's an f- interesting thing around that. My, I once went to... So we were also... We used to go up to, like, the big drum and bass nights at, um, in Bristol, and I was a resident DJ at some of them, just armed with CDs. So you'd give a CD to Brian G., Ronnie size <laughs> die and um obviously I have a little phone number on it and I was going up to Fabric one night and you were actually on the lineup I think I don't know it was like full cycle in room one and then scratch perverts yeah. and and I think you were in there that's it yeah and uh that. on the way up to Fabric I got this call and Ronnie size uh was on the other end of the line he's like yo 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 that tune no more ghosts I'm, I'm gonna play it I'm going to play at Fabric and tonight. I was like, what? I'm going to be there. Just and, uh, that blowing your f- mind. That, yeah, I think I was about 18 or something. That was the first time I heard my tune in Fabric. and That's insane, isn't it? Yeah, big up Ronnie. Hold tight, Ronnie, all day. Yeah. I was with him in January, I think it was. Um, always lovely. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. And Dynamite as well. Yeah. One legend. of the nicest MCs. Legend. Yeah, legendary. I mean, these are all legends. Production in the drum and bass world, I would I would argue that it's probably one of the most techy superior um, uh, production lines as a genre. Definitely, and, and definitely back then, I kind of grew. I came into that era where production really the mix down was everything, and I I kind of came up just as just before that era. So that time, like when I was telling you with Ronnie played the 
tune in the club. The mix downs probably weren't that good mm. back then, but they had a vibe and he played it. But then, Pump it, yeah. not long after that, Pendulum came out and I think they really, for better or worse, changed the game in drum and bass because they just had this slick, like huge wall of sound kind of vibe where yeah. if you played anything after them it just sounded crap. Yeah. I think I, I think with, I think if they it felt like uh drum and, if it wasn't drum and bass they would have done it to a, another genre because yeah. they just kill it in production like that. Yeah. I think they what well, takes it to that level. Next yeah, next yeah. level what next level science is science to it and I think the the technology was definitely moving into all digital at that point as well mm. like a lot People were still using hardware, but yeah. I think they were all. They, I think they were all digital. I might be wrong. In but, the box, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but they managed to get this sound, which was just like huge. Just... And as a producer coming up back then in those days, even the 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 tricks of the trade to get things to sound big, people weren't that willing to show you. Even like <laughs> your mates, like. Like Hugh Clips, he might show you a little thing. You like that, do you? You like that? You like that? Hey, hey, yeah, but they won't show you like everything. <laughs> they it was back then, it was kind of drum and bass was like a bit of a closed, mm. like a few people got in, yeah, yeah. but it was kind of like a closed mm. gang. It's not so like, members club. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I struggled through them years. Maybe it's because I was enjoying working at Native a bit too much as well, and I could have applied myself more, but. Um, Getting, to, I remember like the the real breakthrough was um, one time I actually I had, I had a couple of tunes and uh, Clips Red Light he's, he he said oh, I want to sign this to my label this this is a banger let's let, let's go and then he, he brought me into the studio and helped me mix it down and showed me a couple of tricks and one one of the things he showed me was just like I bet you're all eyes I bet you just and it, and the secrets fuck. in his name as well Clips and Red Light he was just like. Just let it hit the red in logic. Like, just don't worry about that. Was this in Bristol? Because I went to his Bristol studio. Yeah, yeah. It's um, live room in front. I think. There was yeah, a, yeah, he had his mate Nathan. Everything you know, the was always in front. The whole mix, all the mixes were red the whole time. Yeah, that, I mean that's just, that's the clues in his name. And I, because I think I I did do a little bit of um, education. I, I did a B Tech, uh -huh. B Tech music technology, oh. and and they always, you know, when you go to school, they always say, you know, digital clipping's do, do. bad, analog yeah. clipping's good, yeah. but digital clipping's bad. So when yeah. he showed me that, and I was like, oh, so you can do it on there as well, mm. and that's how you get things loud. Mm. And then the penny dropped for me, and I was like, oh, okay. Mm. And um, yeah, I think the the. The fact that there there's, should be no rules. I think yeah. that them two years that I did at college as a 16-year-old probably put my progression back because there were certain rules that I was... Another thing's phasing. You worry about... I mean, I'm getting a bit techie now, but like... Hey! You, you hey, work, it's your podcast, buddy. We're going in. You know, you're told if you pl play the sound <laughs> twice, you know, put the same sound on two different channels, it's yeah. going to phase and it's going to cause problems. Yeah. But... Then there's also a thing called parallel compression, which I take took me ages to understand. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Put a tr the same sound on a different track and compress the fuck out of it, mm. then mix it in with the other signal, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's another way to get things sounding fat, fat and loud. And big, and, yeah, and yeah, I, I think once I kind of got a bit further up in that drum and bass game, and I was, got in the studio of people like Break and. Um, I worked a lot with Dai in mm. those we made quite a few tunes together and and you realize that all those things that you the the rules they're there to be broken and that's how yeah. you innovate for you sure break the rules you should, there, there's no rules there are no rules when you're um and, and here's the best way that I cuz obviously I I do my own sounds with the beatboxing and I treat it's it's a mad one I treat it like uh it's, it's a sound design but when putting it in the context of something, I don't know, I kind of like stuff ready built. I like it already built. So all I've got to do is just drop it in. And then everything else is just like shading and just like, so I'm only thinking it from an art point of view, but like it's like those little details, the attention, the filtering on certain things, the saturation on certain things. Mm. It all creates a different, it creates that perspective. Um, how much sound designing do you do? Do you do a lot of sound designing? And, and Yeah, I such? kind of, I do a lot. I mean, I, these days in my life, I guess I've got 
few strings to my bow. Like my main breadwinner these days is I do mix engineering for people. I do a lot for like Toddler T and a few, I've done a few big rap records over the past sort of 12, 16 months. And was, it one of, was, one of Bugs, was it Bugsy, one of them? Then, uh, yeah, I did the Bugsy Malone one. Yeah. I did Boasty. Um, did, Sick. Do you know the track um, Frontline by Parsalu? It's a kind of underground. He's like no. a Gambian. He's a, he's a oh, Gambian um, artist, a UK Gambian artist from Coventry. And yeah, he had I think this yeah, Frontline, which uh, was almost big so. last summer. And uh, I did no, that. No, no, um, and yeah, what else? This track called Strike Me a Pose, Young T and Bugsy, that yeah. one went platinum. So I've done. I've that been, shit is crazy. But I also do the odd like stuff for acoustic musicians yeah. and just. I guess that's. I found that a really nice thing to do as it's kind of like it it's a bit easier to rely on that kind of income than gigs you know because as, mm. as you know as a musician your kind of career can ebb and flow don't know what you're talking about and <laughs> and you know it, can, it it got to a point a couple of years ago where it's yeah not really good you know the financial side of it can fuck with your mental health if you don't know you know if, when the next money's coming in yeah, or, yeah festival season's finished and you haven't got any club gigs in the diary and you're like oh how am i gonna pay my bills this winter and, yeah and uh so i've really enjoyed having this mix engineer inside to me and mm. I, f I get as enough creative so i guess as creatives you you kind of have this itch that you need to scratch mm. i find if i'm not creating yeah, yeah, something yeah. You, you get angry like yeah. it's, it's kind of like meditation almost ah, do, do, but you mix engineers when you well you as a when you've got your mix engineer head on that's like zen isn't it that's just like yeah. meditation in itself definitely it's kind of, yeah you, you you just get in the flow state and you're yeah. you're just oh you know. said flow state on a podcast Ooh. come on that's a, that's Ooh. a that's one of them trending ones in the podcast world hold really? tight is it <laughs> hold tight flow state hours, hours can go by can't they when you're yeah. when you're deep in concentration and mm. um I don't, I've probably lo lost track of what mm. we we're trying to talk about but mm. yeah so I guess I do mix engineering and then that frees me up to just really do what the hell I want with mm. music and it almost becomes a bit more of a hobby and you can afford to just not worry about whether people are gonna yeah. listen to your tune or whether you're gonna get gigs off the back of it and mm. you're just putting out stuff that you know fulfills your creative wants and needs so. mm -hmm. yeah because if you find the creativity in the thing you're do, doing then it, it it serves its purpose um when you're when you're in the mix because we're talking about zen and uh, you know flow state etc do you find um do you find respites within that like when sometimes do you ever feel like you lose perspective on a thing when you're on it too long yeah yeah that, that's one of the good things about having the dog recently mm -hmm. is it's like if he comes to the studio with me i can't sit there for mm. five hours without taking a break mm. you know because your ears get tired and it's easily done and i'm not you're saying you're turning up the treble and everything. Yeah, <laughs> you're not. I'm not the best <laughs> yeah. discipline-wise with that. I you know, I can spend long hours yeah. and then come in the next day and think, what was I doing? Oh, you know, dude. <laughs> just complete, yeah, yeah, and then you think, oh, well, I sent it to them. <laughs> Shit. Don't play that one. No, <laughs> hold on. I've, I, I gave you the wrong one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they were um, <laughs> Definitely breaks. I mean, there are bits of software that you can get that kind of force you to take breaks, aren't they? A little... I've seen other producers using them. A little window comes up and says, "Like stand up." It's like, it's as it goes ping, that's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. Sorry. That's he's going for a fag break. But thing. I don't actually <laughs> use them because I find I, my style of mixing and production is quite um, CPU intensive, and of course, yeah. And the less apps going on, the better. I find. So right, okay. Yeah, because anything that gets in the way of that CPU can yeah, do exactly. under, right? <laughs> okay, so. Uh, Everything's in the box, then? Yeah, I'm all in the box. I mean, I'm not against hardware. I've had hardware over the years, but, yeah, I guess I've just found my sound in the box. When I'm creating music, I do use a lot of, like, real sounds, like, yeah. for example, the Just Now project, which I do with my friend Keshav, who's he's a musician and mainly percussion player from Trinidad, and so we were recording a lot of, like, live percussion, and then I'll mm. process and saturate the fuck out of yeah. it and create new sounds out of his raw materials and quite often he'll just pick up things out of the kitchen and 
we'll record them really badly as well and just you know no no like yeah. just whatever's around we try and just get the ideas out quickly and um how much of that do you reverse engineer though so if you put it in okay right not the yeah okay not the 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 live instrument side but but if you've got that cl- coming together with something that's in the box you know all the your kind of 808 subs and all the other yeah. kind of trims and tops and stuff that you put into your production do you reverse engineer them or do you room them do you room your sounds sometimes to match the the room or vibe of the the real instruments mm, possibly i mean i do a lot of like i love to run i mean saturation distortion yeah. amps yeah, yeah, that's yeah. like a big part of my sound you know like the, the, i guess that comes from the drum yeah. and bass thing resampling filter yeah. distort it create new harmonics and mm. most of my bass lines are like i'd say 90 percent of the bass lines in every tune i've made since forever has come from an 808 and mm. often the same sample that's so but sick they all sound completely different because yeah. it's a it's a process you you know i've got i don't know hundreds of different distortion plugins yeah. and I, you know however i'm feeling on the day you, you, you don't know where it comes from it's kind of like yeah, they're almost like you can never have enough, different right? instruments. Yeah, you can never. They've have... all got a slightly different sound, and you, and then you can put, you might put six of them on one channel, and then put a couple filters in between, and bounce it out, and then put it in a sampler, mm. and pitch it up, and mm. put some reverb on, and mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. suddenly you got a whole different sound. I, I keep meaning to, I've got this idea in my head that I want to try and make a tune from just one eight oh eight sample and build a whole track like melody drums kick mm. snare hats mm. out of just processing and resampling that same 808 i think yeah, that'd be quite a cool that'd idea be so but, sick. but um haven't got around to it yet i wonder um what the dog is eating in the, the other room <laughs> <laughs> it sounds crunchy and plasticky it sounds should I, should yeah, I go just go and have a just there quick <laughs> <laughs> what, are what are you doing populous i think it's good talk from a coffee pot so oh, that's all right, that's man. All right. That's all right. That's love. That's love. That's love. That, that goes in the bin anyway. Um, when you get given a project, no one in particular, but somebody that you're a fan of, and you're like, yo, like, I've got to make this work. Um, how, how, because, and this is where I'm coming from the producer's role and the engineer's role, it's almost like all in the same now. It's almost mm. like you've got to think three steps ahead as a writer as to what's going to make something sound right in the mix or even as far as mastering. Like, what, when you're given a project, how deep do you go to the point where it's like, actually, I kind of, I kind of did co-write this or I did produce it? Um, I guess with a lot of the stuff I do, there's not a huge amount of additional production. They're kind of finished songs, although sometimes they do, like, chop and change, like take vocalists off and you might get asked to do a little edit and Mm. stuff but there's never been i mean i'm quite new to this doing the mix engineering as a as a professional hey you ain't doing too bad mate you got yourself a there's a fucking job there for you i tell you (laughs) getting all this platinum business kicking off you know but um thank you but uh yeah i guess more so because i also have a record label called more time records Mm -hmm. and um I mixed down every release on that label as well, which is we've we've had quite a we've we've been running three years now. We've had released quite a catalogue. Yeah, dude. Over the over the past three years, and um, that's mad. That's insane. That so nothing goes past, past nothing on your watch. Up. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, I think we're on. I can't remember. Yeah. Definitely twenty, thirty plus releases. Some of those are albums. A lot of them are four or five track EPs, and. Uh, some of them you have to do more work to others. And one of the things I've really liked about that label is I'll often, I think as I was talking about the struggle growing, growing up in the drum and bass scene and probably I, I, did, I didn't release a lot of music as, as interface coming up because half the time I used to spend like weeks trying mm. to work out that mix down months. A lot of critical and, thinking when you're starting, isn't there? With yeah. those, especially with that genre as well. And part of me wishes I'd just put out some of them back yeah. in the day. Because it really doesn't matter that much. Only, I mean, in that scene, it did. If if you wanted DJs to play it, but I think feel like there's people that might have enjoyed 
the music mm. anyway. Or been inspired. You, you, mm. You're definitely an organism when it comes to that genre. When you think about all the pe- all the artists that have come through and have mm. gone to doing other things or gone from one you know, bad company to fresh. Yeah, boom, yeah. Boom, like, you know. Yeah, chasing status. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people... Um, they changed their style and developed. Yeah. yeah, you're right. But yeah, as I was saying with the label, I often will find tracks like our kind of ethos with the labels, kind of like global club music. So we've had releases from uh, a rapper in Ghana called Bright, who now lives over here. Um, uh, we've got a producer from South Africa called Mishimo. We've got a guy in Mexico called Omar. They all make kind of like, you know, it's kind of like UK funky mm. club mm. sounding stuff. And it's great with the internet that you can be in touch with all these people around the world same. who are into the same thing as you. But often the the ideas that I hear are rough diamonds. So I'm like, that's got a sick groove and mm. really cool idea. But it just, people ain't going to play it how it's sounding like that. So it's great to get the stems and like beef it up yeah, uh, to a point where hopefully those artists get a bit more recognition because there's some... You know, I think I think when I was younger, I had really cool ideas that were quite different to what was going on in drum and bass, but a lot of them never came out because we just couldn't get the sound right. Mm, yeah. So it's nice to be able to kind of give that back, give back, and way, yeah. help help kind of up and coming producers a bit, and and not be secretive with the with the knowledge. I think it's good to share knowledge, and in this, it. You know, in the modern era, you can learn it all on YouTube anyway. Back then, yeah. you didn't have YouTube or you had to read books. Uh, which, you know, some, some, people culture, are be- some people are better at reading, learning from reading than others. Yeah. We all learn in different ways, don't we? But Bro, there's, there's, there's no excuses anymore. Like, you can be... If you want to learn something, just go on YouTube. Mm. Don't be don't be precious yourself. It's a dub, that dub plate era, isn't it? Yeah. Of, of protection. And... But it was special at the same time. I loved like, I'm not it, hating dude. on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, there was a real yeah. mystique, you know, tunes that would be out. You'd be waiting for years. Only certain DJs could play it. And then you'd be like, yeah. oh, I can get it now. Love it. Love it. There was so many as well. And this is the unfortunate thing about dub plates and all that is there's some tunes that you can hum even now. But you fucking find them for no love, no money, right? Yeah, I remember... <laughs> um, Quite early in my raving years, uh, do you remember the tune Messiah, the drum and bass tune? It's kind You'll of, have to hum it, me, bad. Well, I will. <laughs> I, I, I remember like taking a trip up to London and going to Black Market Records, and, yeah. and I was like, "Have you got that tune that goes, oh?" And it's just like <laughs> he was like, "Yeah, Messiah." Yeah. There you go. It's because everyone was, else has done it like the last and week. And it was on like a seven vinyl pack that you had to pay like 30 40 quid for at the time but everyone yeah. bought that because of that one tune there was a few other bangers on the pack yeah. as well but. there is still that culture of in production doesn't matter what genre it is I, I love it when like you have to go out of your way to find it you know mm. it's kind of you don't have that so much anymore do but you but when you i mean when, like if you're in a club for instance yeah. and you hear something and you're like shazam true <laughs> true there's shazam. when you can't get it on shazam you know you yeah, know yeah. you're in trouble yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. right <laughs> yeah what's maybe this things are so accessible now maybe mm. that is maybe that's an argument like the amount of times where there's so much like we were saying from the jump of the podcast there's so much going on so much yeah you can't even keep in the name that you're watching let alone, like, remember it on your phone in Shazam, you know, screenshot mm. it. It's like, there's just so much. That's, I think that's why um, you see so many people talking about, yeah, meditation and all this kind of stuff now, because there is, we're living in an era of information mm-hmm. overload. Mm. And it it does get a bit much. And there's so much interesting stuff that you want to see. And then you, mm. but you end up half the time not even getting to the interesting stuff because there's loads of mm. other crap information how does that work as a producer though because you must need you need a, a designated like window of time sometimes mm. days and especially separating yourself from a project to give it a couple of days and then listen but it must be quite hard when you've got like your, your twitter pinging off or your instagram yeah. it must be hard for producers and it's also juggling different like i'm 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 bad i've got loads of projects on the go that i've been meaning to finish and i know and I know they're good. And like for, for example, I was in Ghana just bef- at the beginning of this year, and I did 
I was out there working with this producer called Gafachi. You should check out his dope. Gafachi. Like the leading Time. kind of underground electronic producer out there. Nice. And um, we uh, spent like t 10 days with him. We came back with like 14 ideas. And I, I've been meaning to work on them ever since, but I just haven't found the time to get in that headspace oh, does he call you up like hey how's it going man he's cool he's relaxed he's doing it he's got loads of other things going on as mm. well and, but i'm i'm really excited to get on and finish that project mm. but yeah i feel like i need to just put a week or two mm. aside to just really focus on it do you have a um do you have a uh a, a time a schedule do you have a time frame when you know things are going to fit and you know when that thing's coming or is it just a really great idea and it just you never quite reach it? No, I think I'll get to it before the end of the year. I, I've i kind of put a deadline in my head that it'd be nice to re release it in January, mm. a year after the trip. Mm. So I guess it needs to be finished by November latest. Because you're like a super proactive producer, engineer. You know, it's it's. I can't imagine you being in that bracket of people that are, that kind of sloth about in the studio definitely playing not. with gadgets and then oh i might just get on with some work oh yeah i've got to do that today that kind of no, you know those dudes lists, <laughs> but i guess the ones that pay your bills are always at the top of the list of course yeah and my own kind of personal creative stuff definitely gets put to the back of the pile hmm. um and then there's also yeah the label so we've got mixed yeah, yeah, which yeah. again doesn't is is more of a passion project as well but it's kind of like people are relying on me mm. so I kind of feel mm -hmm. that I need to do that first yeah, yeah. so but at the same time I managed to like I've got an uh, an EP dropping next month the first EP under my, back back to my old name or Sam's face on RNS Records um, how do you define snow and and all the other projects, because the Snow one's an interesting one for me, because, like, I mean, there's definitely that Broken Beat influence and the collaborative side of things. Mm. I, so I, was... I guess the timeline goes, Interface was me, young kid from Glastonbury, yeah. came to Bristol, was a crew, then it ended up being just me. Mm. Um, then in 2011, I went, I think up till 2010, 2011, I was quite a kind of closed mind junglist, mm -hmm. like, you know... Although I had the experience of, I definitely loved other music, but in terms of my own production, mm -hmm. I was involved in a rap crew that um, back then I produced for as well. Same. They were called Central Spills. They were, they were, they were, we were kind of like, I guess, Bristol's version of Levels, but before Levels happened. And we were, <laughs> nice. But we, we were all just kind of like wreckheads, so we never really got that much done. Uh, right, okay. But, um, so nothing really happened with, too much of that project but it was fun times but I, i'd always been like dabbled in other music but then yeah 2011 went to trinidad and just kind of at that point i was a little bit kind of jaded from drum and bass like i was kind of um the, the the format of 175 beats per minute everything if you everything's very quantized and like there's only so many grooves and yeah ideas feel that. you can do mm -hmm. and i went yeah i kind of had this random trip to Trinidad, Trinidad, which came out of nowhere. I, I was just coming out of a kind of hectic relationship. Uh, I, like, all of our friends were the same. Bristol just suddenly felt like a place I couldn't be for a minute. And um, right. I met this guy, Keshav, a couple of times. Was he, was, he was touring through Bristol. And he was like, if you ever want to come to Trinidad, i got a sofa, you can come, come stay. And the carnival was coming up, so I was just like... Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, why not? And I'd, I'd always been influenced by like Caribbean culture, more so Jamaican, mm. being Grant, being Bristol jungle, dark reggae, uh. um, and that for me was like, okay, that's that's kind of close. It's yeah. almost Jamaica. Yeah, so yeah. I've I've always wanted to go to Jamaica. Let's go to Trinidad. And I didn't had no idea <laughs> about what was going to happen when I got there. Didn't even know if I I was going to get on with this guy who I'd met a couple of times mm -hmm. and went there for a month. It was carnival season, and and the place just blew my mind. Like I, I completely fell in love with it. Um, the culture, the food, the people, like made some lifelong friends. Sick. And, um, that is so sick. And it flipped, totally flipped. You know, he, he's super t talented musician, but also like the music that was going on out there. That soca music is such a strange. I mean, you'll know about it, but around here being 
on the carnival route. But mm -hmm. it's quite a strange insular music scene, which other than the car, it kind of lives within carnivals mm -hmm. and they, they, their industry yeah, works yeah. in a totally different way to any other music. Mm -hmm. And I just fell in love with that, the energy and just how much the people love love the music out there really really got into yeah. my got under my skin and i i kept going out there for the next kind of five or six years and i guess fell in love with music that's more you know that's not quantized that's got it's all about yeah. the groove it's about the bit the bits in between the lines that's and, right um, i love that that's what i love i mean being a beatboxer that that's certainly the quantized yeah. thing the quantized thing has its place yeah but. i mean it's there's a certain sound of hip hop as well, which is built over those MPC yeah. quantized settings that aren't straight. They they're swung. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's like pitch down, right? That's the kind of low and slung kind of pitching that they do on yeah. on the forty uh, fives. And I guess it's down to the way. Sometimes it's like JD, for example, he wouldn't even quantize anything. Would no, just play it. And you don't miss it. It's like it feels like it's cohesive. It's mm. together. That's real skill. It's a real skill, isn't it? And so I kind of just, yeah, that that's where, so we, we started a project called Just Now, which was kind of like me, from a drummer bass guy from Bristol, making music with, with a kid from Trinidad. And we, we created a band and had like um, MC, Kerwin Prescott came over to stay. Basically at one point Mad. I had like, three or four trinnies sleeping in my living room for like three summers long while we were doing all the festival circuit with our band and stuff. And like that was, yeah, really informed my kind of, you know, we, we learned a lot from each other, me and Keisha yeah. in that process. So then, um, but then I moved to London and I was, and I was making a lot of music on my own um, without him, which kind of sounded similar to just now, but wasn't, it was a bit more UK, it was a bit more cold. Right. And I just put the S in the now and put snow. Um, and yeah, started with my label around that time. But yeah, m recently there's there's another snow who came out slightly after me. I put a line through the snow. Obviously there's the informer right. snow, which That's a lot right. of my friends gave me grief about anyway. No, I think this is, the, but I've kind of forgot that <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I just you know what I mean. He's one of those kind of characters. Okay, that's that why I put the dude. line through the oh, I drew drew a line through him. Yeah, yeah. In, inform if he dead. <laughs> but um, shut, 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 shut. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then this other guy came out who did the same thing with the line, and he's like a I think he's an Australian kind yeah. of s s sad rapper type dude who okay. um he and he's really popular and and you just can't. You need to do a track with him. That'd be fun. <laughs> Yeah, and you just can't search my name on Spotify or anything. Yeah, and you're you are elusive. I yeah. will give you that. You're an elusive character, but the what, S, what they call it SEOs. My SEOs on that name are really bad. Yeah, search engine optimization. Yeah, right. Um, so I just decided, but I respect that though. I I really have a again goes back to the dub plate thing. Well, you got. A, yeah, you know I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a, yeah. a, a jewel. You've got to fucking find it. Yeah, yeah. and I, it's very different music and underground. But I just decided. Yeah, I'm just going back. I feel I never fully felt comfortable with that name anyway. And I think with my mix engineering stuff and also like some of my recent productions, of, they're not drum and bass, but they definitely got a lot more influence with what I was doing years ago. I just thought, the let's production bring it back. The values, yeah, the yeah, value, yeah. Uh, techniques. A few break beats in there. Yeah. And, For um, sure. Yeah. And again, it, it, it goes back to the Zed Bias approach as well. Like, I feel like he... He's he, had a few names over the years, hasn't he? Yeah, to, true that. And all, but also his te his techniques, I think they they flit yeah. as well. You do, you kind of ebb and flow. And what yeah. what's inspiring you at the time? I think now, in terms of now, I've been more... I, ha I haven't gone there yet, but I'm definitely more interested in going back to doing a bit more like jungle. There's a lot of people making jungle at 160 mm. these days where there's a bit more room for grooves and there's a mm. lot more interesting sounds coming out it's a new oh, kind of wave of like um like the six figure gang yeah. crew from london and um lots of interesting things happening at that faster tempo um yeah. which inspires inspires me more it's, it's, a, it's a cool it's it's a weird time in the world but it's an interesting time for music that's right oh it's um i went to the fabric not so long ago just before lockdown, so yeah. Um, 
I, I just was like taken aback just by the variety that's in drum and bass at the moment. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Just in terms of the sonics and the, the, yeah, it just blew my mind, you know. Yeah, break, I've been listening to a bit of breakage. Breakage and break, they're two of the ones for me that they really come with the sound. Break is actually a good friend of mine. We were neighbours in Bristol, studio neighbours. Bristol's still holding it down, man. (laughs) And uh, he's actually on my next EP. We've got a track Mm. together. Well, you're Croydon at the moment, right? Yeah, Crystal Palace. Crystal, Crystal Palace. Palace. So yeah. Do you go? Do you go back to Bristol? You go back to the West Country? Yeah, I haven't been for a while, obviously with lockdown and that. But um, yeah. I look forward to going back soon. Mm. I think I've been in London what five or six years now, mm. and the first three years I was going back regular. I think because I definitely I missed it. I mm. still miss it, but I've kind of. The first three years, I, it took me a while to get into this London lifestyle, especially living down in South. And I was a bit older when mm. I came up here, so I wasn't like out all the time. Mm. It took took me a while to get used. To, a lot of time it was just like me and my missus. I, I moved up because my girlfriend's from from London. And, yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, that'll do it. But I'm happy I did. Well, I think you know, it feels like it, it feels. I knew, I knew what you were from originally the West Country. Um, but it feels like, and it's kind of the reason why I wanted to have you on, is because you have developed such a tastemaker lane. Like, you, there's not that many things you haven't achieved f- from an underground, uh, early adopter tastemaker point of view. You've done mm. a lot of stuff. Thank you. What, what, what is the thing? What is the thing that define a, you would say is defining in your career from a from a dance genre background that you could be like right you know what i've done this i've done this all and now i want to take it to that next level or actually you know what i've, I've done now because i've just done that and it's apart from being on the killer color podcast hey, of course, yeah. you know I mean? but, but you know what i mean what is the thing that you're like yo i, I would happily put my hat down if if that if i killed that um i don't know i don't, I don't know if i ever think that deeply i'm just constantly excited by new sounds and new grooves yeah. and kind of more so than ever, just meeting interesting people and work working with them. I'm I'm definitely more of a collaborator than a than a. I work slowly on my own. Mm. I don't, like if I'm in a room with other people, like that's what I like in terms of making music. That's what I like to be working with, and yeah, to, to people that are very different from what you do. Like that, that's why just now worked so well because we were literally the opposite. He was like super talented mu- musician mm. he was producing we met because he was making drum and bass and i heard his drum and bass tunes and i was like some cool musical ideas mm. but the sound's totally not yeah what it needs to be for uk drum and does bass. it itch you when you hear something you're just like oh shit you know what you're you're on that 80 percent, but there's just this little bit more i mean now it doesn't because it'd be like if i really like it i'll help them yeah but um back then i still wasn't that good but we started working together and mm. i guess we learned from each other like i learned more about mm. grooves and mu- I'm still not very good with musical theory. I don't play any instruments. I mean, I, I can, I know the bit of the th- enough theory to get by, but that's yeah. why it takes me longer if I'm working on my own. Prefer to. But like you said, there's no rules. So what, yeah. what would that do? It'd probably cloud your perspective of what you, of what's current and what's r- relatable to what you want to hear. True. Mm. True. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to be said for not know. You know, just because it's. The notes not in the scale doesn't mean it can't go in there if it mm-hmm. feels right to you. Yeah. Like that's it's again true, no man. rules. No rules. Sometimes that's what makes songs special, isn't it? It's the imperfections. Yeah. Thousand percent. Mm. Ain't nothing better when it's nothing better when you do something ad hoc or do something that you just weren't intending on doing. It comes out of nowhere and you play it to someone they're just like, Oh yeah, that's all right. Yeah. And you're <laughs> yeah. like, Oh good, great. You know? You say, oh, I'm not sure about this, what do you reckon? Yeah. Yeah. Dude. Banger. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, that's whack. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine if someone said that to Scream of Anger back in the day or something? Mm, it's you know a bit mean? Silky weird. or someone just yeah. like, oh, yeah, no, not sure about this this beat. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Speed it up, put it, put it on there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But luckily, they were all into it, weren't they? Yeah. The production world, man. Mm. It's been a pleasure having you on, my brother. Thanks for having me, Thank man. Thank you so much. Sam to face the mighty snow inside the place. Yeah. Um, where can they check out your stuff? Okay. That's really important. They find um, this. At Sam underscore interface on Instagram, Facebook, SoundCloud. My label is 
more time records Got it, uh, check it. that out too and yeah i think that's it that's it thank you very much for passing through it's been a real fucking pleasure yeah, thanks for having me man Killer Cat Podcast, doing it again. Share and share, like, tell a friend to tell a friend and don't talk to any strange ones, all right? Because they're definitely out there. <laughs> Stay lucky, people. Peace. <laughs>